Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of July 9th, 2018. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. I join Michael on the show each Tuesday morning from 9.15 to 10 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our top three issues. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 9 to 11 a.m. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, Alaska Public Media swallows Governor Walker's campaign theme, hook, line, and sinker. Here's how and the problem. Second, we need to revamp state government's approach to budgeting. Here are the issues and here's the solution. And third, what we will be looking for during Wednesday's Alaska legislative hearings into the Alaska LNG project. And now, let's join Michael. Brad Keithley joins us every week to discuss oil, gas, and the economic forecast of Alaska. It's the Michael Dukes Show. Uh, Brad Keithley is with Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. He is a former oil and gas consultant and attorney, and he founded Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget to help bring the state of Alaska back on track because we, folks, we are in trouble. We are run amok, and we need to do something, and that's why Brad does this. Every week he comes in to talk about his top three, the top three things he thinks that we need to pay attention to. So, Brad, let's kick things off today. What do we got going on? Well, let's start with an article in the uh, Alaska Public Media uh, website, and they had it uh, online as part of the radio, the uh, uh, the APM, APM uh, news program. The headline was, with permanent fund draw, higher oil prices bring Alaska closer to a balanced budget. And and the, the theme behind the, or the, 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 the gist of the story is that as oil prices go up, the state gets more in revenue from production taxes uh, and royalty, and as a result of that, we close, we're closing the fiscal gap. That much is fine, but it's the, it's the sort of the conclusion they jump to uh, that, that I think is problematic and is misleading uh, to the public. About halfway down the, uh, the article, they quote Ken Alper, who is the director of the tax division of the Department of Revenue, as saying this, should the current prices hold, we will have our first balanced budget in several years for fiscal year 2019. Alaska could have a balanced balanced budget next year if prices stay around $72 a barrel. That's about $10 higher than the official forecast the Department of Revenue put out in March. That, Michael, is dependent on one critical factor. Okay. And that is that the state continues to cut the PFD and take half, roughly half the revenue that otherwise should be going to the PFD, takes it into the budget. Right. The budget doesn't. The budget doesn't balance uh, if the state uh, pays out uh, the PFD as it's according to it, as the statute provides. So what what this article is leading you to believe is that, and what Walker is going to claim during the campaign, is we fix the fiscal problem uh, between a combination of the, quote, permanent fund draw, which is the euphemism for the, for the PFD cut, between the, quote, permanent fund draw and higher oil prices, we f- fix the fiscal problem. And you can, just see, you can just see that line coming out of Alper's statement. And, and my problem with APRN, with, with Alaska Public Radio News, is that they just swallow that hook, line, and sinker. There's nothing in this article that, that talks about the, 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 the role that the PFD cut is playing in here. There's nothing in this article that talks about the dependence of that statement on continued cuts to the PFD. So you come away from the article, and if you're listening to it uh, on the radio, you come away from listening to this segment thinking, ah, oh, we got it solved. We're, we're all done. 
But but the but the point they're overlooking, the point they just leave out entirely, is it's dependent on continuing to tax the PFD and take that money from the PFD um, into the general fund. So it leaves people with the impression that that we're done. We've got the fiscal problem solved. We can keep spending to the same level we've been spending in the past. Walker got it solved. Not true. Uh, and and the article doesn't give any hint of what the underlying factors are in that. Right. And what I love about that, of course, is that they, well, I mean, I guess maybe it's because it's NPR, but they, they focus primarily, again, on the public economy. They do not talk at all about the impact of pulling that billion dollars a year out of the private economy for the last two years, of course, dropping us into the deepest recession, highest unemployment rate, and all those other things. None of those even factor into this article at all. No, and it's, it's just like I, I mean they they this article essentially, uh, and I and I'm not sure the reporter realized what they were doing, but by by swallowing the administration's line, but this article essentially tries to normalize PFD taxes. It essentially tries right. to normalize uh, the reduction the reduction in the PFD and say, well, uh, we got that in the bag now. We've got those revenues in the bag. Uh, and we can move on, and 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 life's going to be happy again. And we can can continue spending at the levels we have been spending. It's just it's just not true. I mean, if you assume that the state goes on and violates the permanent fund dividend statute uh, as it's as it's done now for three years in a row, first the governor, and then with legislative complicity by the legislature cutting it in the appropriations process. If you assume the state's going to continue to violate the permanent fund dividend statute, yeah, I guess I guess maybe you do have it solved. <laughs> but but assuming that you're violating a statute uh, is is I, I think just just misleading to uh, to the public. Yeah, and I think this has really been kind of the move on the part of the Walker administration. As you said, this has become their campaign credo at this point. Their campaign credo has become uh, we've saved the state by tapping into that. So don't pay attention to the fact that we tapped into it because, hey, we saved the state by doing that. And so this is how we are now the heroes of it, even though, damn, you just, you know, gutted the economy uh, to save the private, you know, to save the save the public economy. Uh, and, and nobody seems to really be saying, wait, that that doesn't seem to balance out quite right. Yeah, and this is, I mean, the reason I'm raising it now is this is going to be a very important issue for uh, in, in the campaign. It's going to be an issue that's going to drive Walker's uh, uh, campaign theme that we that we fixed the problem, uh, we we've, we've saved the state. Now give us another term to go on and do whatever we want to do in the next term. That's going to be their driving theme. You can see it come out in this article, and for the and for the press particularly. Uh, 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 APRN, Public Radio Network, which, you know, prides itself on being nonpartisan, for the press to start buying into this theme without critically analyzing it, uh, I think, portends big problems uh, for the state. So it, we've got to get on top of this issue. I, 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 I feel that, that the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets needs to get on top of this issue quickly before the rest of the press starts buying in on this theme without critically thinking about about what the administration's really saying uh, going forward about the uh, about the, the the PFD. Well, you and I have had conversations about this recently in the recent past. That this seems to be a reoccurring theme in the state of Alaska is that we seem to be having a problem with our journalists not really doing any kind of deeper analysis on what's going on out there. They seem to be just you know fat and happy with. You know, hey, whatever the press release says, that's what we report instead of, you know, maybe we should do, again, some deeper looks at what's going on. Yeah, it's I mean, you, you, the, the press would argue that part of the part of the issue is there's less of them. Right. There's less of the press. So they're they're stretched more thinly trying to cover the range of stories that are out there uh, and they don't really have the time it takes uh, to dig down, dig down into these stories. And and that's sort of that's sort of the the response you get, um, but but look, you know, you're going to have to dig down into some of these stories. This is one of the critical issues in this election cycle. Are we finished? Are, are we out of the the fiscal uh, uh, issues that we're confronting in the state, 
or not? The answer is we're not. The answer is we're still spending too much relative to our revenues, um, and the only way they're making this work is by taxing half the PFD, taking it out of the hands of the private sector, which has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy by doing that, is by far the costliest to Alaska families by cutting the PFD. The only way they're making the claim that that we've got a balance that we balance the budget or we're about to balance the budget is by cutting the PFD. Hurt right. as you say correctly, hurting the private economy, hurting Alaska families. That's that's the only way. And and so that's a critical issue uh, in this election for all the candidates. How are you going to get us through this fiscal crisis? Letting the Walker administration off the hook and claim, hey, we've done it. Uh, uh, without really any any harm to anybody. Look, you know, oil prices came back up. Uh, we we made some cuts to spending. They will say, uh, and and magically, poof, you know, we we've, we've done it. Letting them get away with that uh, uh, in the press is doing the state a disservice. It's 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 allowing candidates to sort of make their campaign themes uh, uh, the news. So yes, I understand that 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 reporters are spread. Uh, thinly, I understand there's a lot to cover, uh, and I understand there's fewer reporters now than there used to be. Uh, but you've got to you've got to identify as as journalists, they need to identify the core issues. The state's fiscal situation is certainly one, and they need to dig into it and become conversant with it, and not be misled by these press releases. Yeah, and and I would agree with that. And again, this comes back to that again deeper analysis. You know, not not taking things at face value, which I think. Again, we, you know, continue to have kind of a problem with here in the state, uh, not taking these things at face value and instead, you know, looking to multiple sources and, and things like my son did an interview with me for a class that he was doing on media writing. And that was really kind of one of the questions that came up was, you know, how many sources of news do you, go? you know, you can't just rely on one source of news today. I don't go. Uh, you know, probably people would think that Fox News is my, you know, weapon of choice or whatever. I don't just go to Fox News. I go to CNN. I go to these. You've got to look at these things from multiple angles to try and get the different perspectives because somewhere in there, in the middle, is the truth. And even if it's an inadvertent truth, like you said, maybe it's not intentional. Maybe it is that they're overworked and underpaid or whatever it is. But the bottom line is there is more to these stories and we have got to, you know, we've got to do that analysis for ourselves and figure out, you know, that's, I mean, kind of that's what's become, that's how citizen journalism has become such a huge thing today. Yeah, that's a, that's an excellent point, Michael. This story does rely entirely uh, on one source. The only source quoted in the story is Ken Alper from the administration. Um, and it relies entirely, um, at least on the face of the story, uh, relies entirely uh, on Alper's uh, analysis of the situation, which, of course, is going to fall follow the administration's line. So you're exactly right. I mean, relying on one source, a single-sourced story, uh, is just buying into the bias of whatever uh, source uh, source you're tapping into. If you don't check your sources, if you don't uh, uh, dig deeper and ask additional people, uh, additional sources about the subject matter that you're covering, you're going to end up with bias. And that's I mean, it's, it's, it's a quick and dirty way to do it. If, you're, if you've got five stories assigned to you during the day and you're just trying to check them off uh, and you get a single source to talk about it and you get some good quotes, so it's a quick and dirty way to do it. But you've got to, we've got to, as a state, to identify the critical issues and get good reporting on it. And if not, uh, if, if we don't get good reporting on it, we need to call out the reporters. Right. Um, I, I mean, I'm sure I'm not making any fans at APRN by – by bringing this up, but we need to focus these reporters on on what the what the core uh, issues are that's confronting the state and how to think about those core issues. Right, absolutely. And I mean, I you know, and I I just think we can't we can't state it enough at this point that that is what needs to happen. We have got to be you know we have got to be diligent in these things because. Otherwise, we're going to, you know, we're going to get the news and just accept it. And like you said, this is a to me, this is a very subtle. Uh, I mean, you've brought it up, but it's a it's actually kind of a, a, a very soft and subtle manipulation of the truth that they as a news organ and we as people seem to be kind of buying into. And uh, and I have a problem with that. Well, I've seen it. I've seen it show up in social media. I've seen people now claiming 
Walker solved it with, with oil prices coming up. What the Walker administration has solved the budget issue. Uh, we need to give him credit for restoring fiscal balance uh, and move on. And trying to discredit, uh, frankly, both Dunleavy and Begich's themes that no, we've still got a problem here because we have hurt the private economy uh, in uh, in trying to save the the the, the, the government sector. Uh, and, and there's more work to be done. So I've seen people in social media pick up this theme. And to see a reporting service like APRN that, that, that you know, prides itself on being, uh, on, on being nonpartisan, to see them pick up that same theme and repeat it uh, is just is, is, is troubling, misleading, uh, whatever, whatever phrases I can, I can come up and pile on uh, at the moment. Let's be absolutely clear. The state's fiscal situation is not solved. We have only papered over it by cutting the PFD, which has the largest adverse impact on the overall economy of all of the fiscal options, and by far is the costliest to Alaska families. It is the favorite option of the top 20%, really the top 10%, who avoid otherwise having any sort of proportionate responsibility for government spending, they slide it off to the middle uh, uh, income and the lower income classes, uh, but it is it has a, the largest adverse impact on the overall economy. The state's fiscal overall fiscal situation, our economic situation, is not solved. And for APRN to be running a story that says, "Oh, it is. We're almost back in balance," uh, is just is just wrong and misleading. Well, and I think Harold brings up a very interesting point. We have to be very cautious because, for example. One of my favorite outlets, quite honestly, is KTVA, and I think it has to do with some of the reporting because I think people like Liz Raines, I mean, they're very dedicated to what they do, uh, and they do a good job. But you also can look at some of the reporting from outlets like KTVA, and you can see some of the slant. And when you, of course, peel back the layers, you realize, for example, KTVA is owned by GCI. We know, of course, Ron Duncan from GCI was very big a part of this Alaska's Future program where they advocated for that taking of the PFD. So there is some, you know, there is some agenda behind this. There's some agenda moving that could be causing some of this. Yeah, it, uh, there, there could be an agenda. Again, I don't want to go there with APRN. I don't want to say that they're that they're in the pocket of the administration. Right, I, I right. honestly don't think they are. But they've got to do better reporting. They've got to dig into these stories. They've got to understand the state's fiscal situation before they start endorsing these sort of these sort of blanket conclusions. I mean, the question to Ken Alper would have been, Ken, um, and so what role is the does the PFD cut play in this? Right. Simple question. Ken, Ken, if he's honest, would have said, "Well, that's a big part of it. That's right. about you know five hundred to six hundred million of of what's causing causing the balance." Um, <laughs> and I think a better I question, think a, I think a better question would have been, "What will happen if the legislature again decides to fully fund the PFD and actually follow the law? What would the effect be then?" <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, because that's kind of more of an honest answer. And it, again, it would st- it would be a dramatic shift. It would, and 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 it would. I mean, it would help out the private sector, which is which is what the PFD, which was not what Governor Hammond's vision originally was to make Alaska, which otherwise owns a hundred percent of the state resource, to shift the benefit of, of a significant part of that resource over to the private sector. Uh, it, it 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 the 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 approach of cutting the PFD undoes that. So yeah, it's it. We've got to find. We've got to get better reporting. Uh, on this issue, and and again, I hope uh, that that by this story coming out early and being slanted unintentionally, but slanted in the way it was, by highlighting that issue, we can we can alert the media that they need to dig down deeper uh, into these claims. This so that I mean, I think that that really shows again how we as as citizens uh, need to be better educated. We need to be questioning things that are put before us. And hopefully that's one of the things we're trying to do on this show is to ask, you know, is to ask those deeper questions and to give you kind of the other side or even maybe even a side by side analysis. That's kind of what we're trying to do here. We're trying to show what each side are saying. We obviously have an agenda. I'm not a journalist. I'm a commentator. So I obviously have an agenda, but we're at least trying to give you both sides of the equation so you understand what it looks like. So that's that's the first. Yeah, well, yeah, go ahead. Well, you've got to have a baseline. You've got to have a factual baseline. 
uh, that, that, I mean, everybody, you, you, the, the common phrase sometimes is uh, you're entitled to your, to your own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts, all right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, we've got to have a common baseline of facts uh, before we can have an educated debate in the state. And, and going off and saying we've solved the budget crisis, oil prices are back up, we've solved the budget crisis, we're almost at, uh, we're almost back up at a balanced budget, with, and ignoring the role that the PFD cut is playing in that and ignoring the role the PFD cut plays uh, in adversely affecting the overall economy uh, is just, uh, that's, not, that's, not a, that's not a complete set of facts. That is, that's commentary. I mean, right. it's, it's saying, yep, Governor Walker's right, here we go. Yeah. Um, it's, not a, it's not a complete set of facts. So we've got, to, we've, got to, we've got to look to the press, and the press needs to step up their game to provide a complete set of facts. Which I think leads us to a good segue of talking um, talking about, you know, how we got here. And I think part of the problem with how we got there, of course, is, you know, they keep framing it. And, and NPR, uh, you know, APRN framed it exactly the same way that the administration and others have had, that we essentially have a revenue problem. You and I have had this discussion many times. We don't really have a revenue problem. What we have is a spending problem. And at the root of this spending problem is, I think, how we – factor the budget. That's why in our charter of changes, uh, you know, number four is change the budget. And what we mean by that, of course, is change the budgeting process. How do we come up with a budget? Because the governor drives the boat at this point. Um, he can't put back in after the veto, but he, he gives you the starting point. And if your starting point is huge, it's easy to stay huge and it's easy to actually even go bigger. Um, and that leads us to our second point, because part of that budgetary process is based on uh, revenue projections for oil and, of course, production revenues, or production uh, production uh, projections as well, and that is really kind of a funky process. And Ed King really goes into this, I think, in 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 a pretty deep and thoughtful analysis. Uh, he does. Uh, so Ed on it's uh, KingEconomicsGroup.com website. The headline of the article is the legislature should not rely on DOR's oil price forecast. You can find it under the uh, tab uh, that's articles uh, on on that website, and it goes into a, a deep uh, dive on how oil prices are used in the budgeting process, and what the consequence of that, uh, what the oil prices that are that are used, how how they drive the budgeting process. Essentially, the legislature, all the way back to the early '80s, uh, has has forecasted oil price. Uh, and the administration and legislature for, forecast oil price, and then from that oil price and production levels, they 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 project uh, overall revenue, and then the legislature uh, each year thinks that's the revenue they have they have to play with, uh, and budget against against that revenue number. Um, Ed goes, Ed's article goes into a great analysis about uh, how the oil price forecast really isn't reliable. It is. It's the it's the result of of, uh, of an October session to get right down to it. It's the result of an October session among various administration officials and various consultants they bring in. Uh, they talk about the factors going on in the oil price, um, and then they uh, they arrive. They all vote on slips slips of paper and vote on uh, a final oil price subject to the commissioner of revenues uh, 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 affirmation, and then he can change it or he can confirm it, and that's the oil price they go with. Now, this is this is October. Let's just take this year, for example. This is October uh, of 2018 uh, that they'll be setting the oil price uh, that will then be used in the legislature that begins in January of 2019 that's working on the budget for <laughs> FY 2020. That budget will begin in July So and, and, and run through the the subsequent June. So basically, we're setting the oil price, we're setting the revenue number for the budget that's going to run from July 1st, uh, 2019 to June 30, 2020. We're setting, we're setting that oil price for that year uh, back in October of 2018. We all know how, how variable oil prices are, um, and we all know that, that unanticipated factors um, uh, uh, how unanticipated factors uh, affect oil prices, drive it up or drive it down uh, during the course of the year. It's hard to predict what oil prices are going to be a month in advance, 
much less basically what this is doing um, uh, 18 months in advance. So uh, Ed, Ed does a great job of, of identifying that issue, identifying that problem, uh, and then sort of going into an analysis of what, of what it leads to. That's, that's on top of the problem of basing your entire budget on oil prices. Ed has a great example in here. He says, what if, what, what if oil prices tell you one year that your, that your revenue is going to be $2 billion and the next year, and, and they tell you that the next year is going to be $10 billion? Should you be spending $2 billion, setting your budget to $2 billion one year and $10 billion next year? No. You should be, you know, setting your budget. If the $10 billion a year goes first, you should be setting your budget in anticipation you're going to have lower oil prices, uh, and setting both on some sort of, some sort of average. So there's all sorts of issues and biases that we've run into, uh, with using oil price, uh, as a, as a, as a, as a, as the central tool, uh, to set the revenue number, uh, in the budget. And Ed, Ed goes through, example after example of, of why that is and how sort of any sort of fix when you're trying to do it this far in advance, any sort of fix uh, really doesn't produce a better result than uh, than what we've been using in the past. Right. Well, and what I think is really interesting is that he goes back and he he analyzes it uh, year to year using, you know, kind of the simple heuristic things. And he goes back 15 years and he says, Here's what the prediction's been. Here's what the actuals have been. And the margin of error is pretty freaking huge. I mean, when it's all said and done. And, of course, we've seen some standout. We've talked about a few of them. Uh, I mean, my favorite is the Sean Parnell one where they factored the budget on $117 a barrel oil when oil was already down to $70 a barrel. I mean, you just cannot... You cannot make those kind of mistakes or those kind of wild, what we used to call the wags, right? The wild ass guesses. You just can't do that and expect that it's all going to work out in the end. It's going to be these these big swings. And he says something about the chicken little thing, which I had to chuckle at because that's what it is. In the big days, everything's good. When it's not, we play chicken little and we run to the other side of the boat and and we're, the sky is falling, and and it it does no one any favors to to make it happen that way. Yeah, exactly right. And 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 what this article, I mean, Ed try, captures it sort of right at the end of the article when he talks about alternate ways uh, to budget. But what this really does is point out the the importance uh, and the and the and the credit and and the usefulness uh, of the Scott Goldsmith approach that that people used to talk about, uh, but don't talk about much anymore. The Scott Goldsmith approach, the ICER approach, takes the long view of Alaska's fiscal, fiscal situation. It, it takes a projection of oil prices. That's a factor in it. But it also takes the returns off the permanent fund because we always knew we were going to get to the day when we had to use the other 50 percent uh, of the earnings, as Governor Hammond uh, uh, foresaw, uh, to help support government when, when oil was no longer sufficient. Um, and it takes into account other things and determines and, and calculates a long-term sustainable revenue level um, uh, that the state should be able to rely on. Now, that has its own variations, but, but, the, but the swings in that sustainable revenue level from year to year are much less wild than the swings that we're getting by by going down uh, going down the, the the approach of using oil prices as we've historically used them. So, I think I think one of the things I'm looking for, I will be looking for um, in this campaign, is our candidates who are sensitive to the problems that that the current budgeting method. Uh, has produced, continues to produce, will continue to produce uh, as long as we stick on it, and who are talking about the need, in addition to, to other fiscal solutions like cutting spending, and if we aren't going to cut spending, looking at other uh, revenue options that have a, a much lower impact on the overall economy in Alaska families, but looking for candidates who are talking about the need to look at the long term uh, and to look at a budgeting process that looks at the long term as opposed to these wild year-to-year swings uh, that we've been stuck with uh, by using the oil price in the, in the current approach we take. Well, this again goes back to my charter of changes question. <clears throat> and you and I have talked about this, but again, for the audience, I mean, you know, to change a thing, my idea 
I mean, the ideal would be zero-based budgeting, right, Brad? I mean, that really would be the ideal, but I don't think that's ever going to happen. I mean, a justification for everything that the state's doing on a zero basis, I just don't see that happening. But taking a page out of the permanent fund uh, a formula and saying, look, if we just took a five-year rolling average of what the revenues of the state have been for the last five years, we would at least be closer. And it'd be interesting. I don't have the skills to do a heuristic uh, analysis like Ed did on this and say, how close was this? You know, if we did this, how close would we be to where we were at? But it would be interesting to see. Um, but if, you know, a five-year rolling average of what the revenues were and base our budget off that, at least we would take out these heady highs and lows, these horrible swings back and forth. We would probably be closer than we would be with anything else that they put forward. We, we might be, we, we, we probably would be closer and we would be smoother in the changes as opposed to, you know, projecting $40 a barrel one year and $60 the next and $80 the year after that. Uh, the changes would be much smoother because you would be you would be uh, uh, smoothing out the impact of any one year uh, through the averaging process. But Michael, we need to have some forward-looking uh, piece to this uh, also because if you if we've been riding uh, on on six on hundred dollar oil and we see that we're going to eighty dollar or sixty dollar oil, you can see the factors coming. Uh, then we need to take that into it. We need to take that into account going forward as well, or else you have you're sort of driven by those higher years, or in the or in the reverse, driven by those lower years, until you sort of cycle that out through the averaging process. So a process like um, uh, like Scott Goldsmith has advocated over time, uh, refined, proposed over time, which looks forward, melding that with with a with a, a historical average as well. Uh, to sort of, you know, put some historical boundaries uh, on the forecast. I think that would probably uh, be the best approach uh, to doing it. And and but that's not what we do. I mean, right now we're just jumping from year to year, right? Right. In October of, of the year before the session, uh, which is the which is the year before we start the fiscal year. In October, we're we're taking a one time guess uh, on what the oil number is, and then we're predicating. The entire budget budget on that, and and those one time numbers are just are just as as Ed demonstrates are are, are wrong. So you're right. We need to have a, a change to how we're going through the budgeting process. History plus a little bit of a forecast uh, uh, probably is a good way to, to smooth that out. Uh, uh, and and it's going to be interesting to hear uh, to to listen and hear if candidates are talking about needing that change because. You know, it, to get this to get the state's fiscal situation back under control, we need not only to address the spending side. We need to not only look at these programs that have gotten locked in uh, by not being looked at, uh, not only not year to year, but in any given year. Uh, we need to not only look at the spending side, but we need to look at how we're doing the revenue calculation. Because Ed's point, and I think a correct one, is the revenues, the, the revenue projections are misleading us. Uh, as to the fiscal situation the state's facing. So not only do we need to address spending, uh, but we need to address uh, the, the revenue side and, and get a better process together uh, for how we're going to for how we're going to project uh, where the state's revenues are going to be in in any given in any given period. Brad Keithley's our guest. He's with Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. We're talking about um, our budgetary process and the fact that we are basing a lot of this off oil projections of pricing and production and uh, and how we could make this better. Um, and I agree with you, Brad. And again, my my uh, my analysis of this was very simplistic. And uh, but I, I think, again, even even that and even the fact that it's not forward looking would still probably do a better job of at least smoothing it out. But let's go back to that idea of zero based budgeting just for a second, because um, I mean, I've talked about it. You've talked about it. Harold says here in the chat room, the state needs to stop basing the budget on any annual oil forecast. It needs to pass a budget based on the delivery of the three basic duties of the state. One, public safety. Two, education. Three, infrastructure with the feds and then back to the basics. And I think that's really what's happened because as with any government, what we end up with is mission creep. What is nice to have versus what is a must have. And I think we've lost our way in that. Yeah, and I, I think that's a fair observation. The the, the problem with zero-based budgeting, uh, I actually have 
some history with this. When Jimmy Carter tried to impose it back in the in the mid seventies when he was president, he came in with the concept of mid base of, of zero based budgeting. I was in the Pentagon at the time and got caught up uh, in that process. The problem with zero based budgeting is really is really two things. One, it takes a huge amount of time um, uh, and to to try to do it each year and try to do all of the government uh, each year. You to to go back and say we're going to start all over and look and build everything up each year it just takes huge amount a huge amount of time um, and 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 really it's time you don't have and what happened right. when you get in those meetings like I was in uh, was yeah I know we're supposed to do zero based budgeting but let's just assume that we that we knew what we were doing last year and sort of go in and and figure out whether we need to make adjustments to it. Uh, you just it, it doesn't because of the amount of time it doesn't work. What I think would work for Alaska uh, uh, is is to say every three years we go in and we examine the big drivers. So we go in the big cost drivers. So every three years we go in and we will examine K through twelve. We will examine Medicaid, um, and we will examine uh, the university system. Uh, uh, to pick a to pick a third example, mm-hmm. and and it, we won't do it all in one year, but we will pick those three big drivers, and we will say we'll do it on a rotating basis. So year one we'll do through K through twelve, year two we'll do uh, 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 Medicaid, year three uh, we'll do uh, the university system, and 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 you dig in, you have the time in that year to dig into that program. And see if if what you're doing is correct. And then the other two years, you 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 do uh, sort of assume what you did that one year, the first year, the year you look at it in detail is correct, and you go on and and tinker with it the other two years while you're looking into something else. I think that approach, which is sort of rolling zero based budgeting, if you will, right? I think that's workable. Uh, and that's doable. It's not something we've done. And opening up the formulas, right? I mean, because that's one of the big drivers here that we're not we've talked about, but we're, you know, nobody else really is talking about, is that these formulas that have static fixed increases in them, you know, on an annual basis, and then we talk about kind of that compounding interest idea. I mean, those have been huge components of this drivers where it just automatically escalates. Nobody's bothering to open up. They take it as a given that it's just going to escalate. That would be something we could address, you know, each year, like, you know, foundation formulas for school and education and things like that. That would be one of those critical components, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, We're not going to solve, just like at the federal level, Frankly, we're not going to solve the, the, the fiscal issues at the federal level without going into mandatory spending, which is formula driven, and, and opening up those formulas and making adjustments. There's just the numbers are too big at the federal level. Mandatory spending is is when you count interest is more than seventy percent of the total spend. So we're not we're not going to solve the federal fiscal issue without going into those programs. At the, the same thing is true at the state level. If we don't go into K through twelve Medicaid. And the other formula programs, one other is transportation for K through 12. I sort of lump it together. If we don't go into those formula programs, uh, we're not going to solve the problems because those are the big drivers of spending. I mean, Governor Walker made a big deal out of, you know, if you eliminate all the state troopers, uh, it wouldn't even make a dent in the, uh, uh, in the, in the overall deficit. Well, that's actually true. Uh, but that's because we have these formula programs that are just, you know, pumping out spending levels uh, uh, on sort of automatic pilot. So, yes, that, that would actually be the big uh, purpose of zero-based budgeting to go into those formula programs, the two biggest of which are K-12 through uh, and Medicaid go into those formula programs and ask the hard questions. The, the, for, the, the, the questions in K-12 through are, you know, do, are there opportunities for uh, savings from school consolidation uh, are there? Do we have the right balance of administration to teachers, uh, uh, and can we improve this situation if we if we make changes that allow us to drive down the number of administrators uh, and increase the number of classroom teachers? In Medicaid, it's too. Are we into? Are, are we have we adopted too many options? Fifty um, uh, right. uh, under under federal Medicaid. Uh, there are certain mandatories, but then there are certain optional services. Alaska's opted into virtually every optional service uh, there is out there. That's a big part of the cost driver. So the question that you go into uh, into Medicaid on is: Do we need all these optional services? Uh, can we cut 
cut down on some of these optional services, cut back on some of these optional services, like other states have. Uh, and how do we do that? How do we how do right. we get a glide path into that? So yes, right. we absolutely have to go into uh, those formula programs, or else we're not gonna we're not gonna. You, there, there's there's no way to affect uh, spending significantly without getting into them. Damn it, Brad! We do this every time, man. You and I just get into it, and we're we're only into two of your top three. And I mean, we're, we've hit the top of the hour, but uh, let's get into your third one. I mean, you're, you're I think you're willing to stick with us, so let's let's get into your third thing. Otherwise, we'll just talk about this for the next two hours. Um, the, <laughs> your, your third one again, I think, is going to wrap back around. Yep. But you, let you hit me with your third one, and, and let's wrap this all up in a nice, pretty Brad Keithley colored bow. Sure. So the third one is uh, our, the legislature is holding joint hearings tomorrow between Senate resources and House resources, uh, uh, an overview of the AK of the Alaska LNG project. Uh, and this is a quarterly review by the legislature uh, where they bring the, uh, the Alaska LNG project uh, leaders uh, before the legislature, uh, have them make a presentation on where the project is, what they see is the as the as the what they've accomplished in the in the past period, what they see as the road ahead uh, in the future, and how they intend to take that road. Uh, and it's a fairly it's, it's it's sort of the LNG sort of is is like a is like an iceberg, right? I mean, a right. bunch of it is going on underneath the water level. This is this is the time that it sort of surfaces above the top, and we can see what see what a, the AKLNG uh, uh, project is doing. Before it before it goes underwater again for the for the following three months. So this is a fairly uh, critical hearing uh, from a public standpoint to sort of get a sense of what's going on, and a fairly critical opportunity by the legislature to ask questions of the project in a public setting uh, of, uh, of to try to get a sense of of what the project's up to. Well, and I noticed that all this testimony is invitation only. I don't. I don't suppose that Brad Keithley got an invitation to come down and testify on this. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. See, I don't seem to get invitations anymore. But I do have. I mean, what 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 I want to do with this segment is is to is to outline the four areas that I would ask questions in uh, if I were a, a legislator, and they're fairly obvious, and I'm sure the legislators are going to to do this. But from a public standpoint, from a from a, uh, 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 the, the perspective of looking at this project from the public, these are the four areas that I'm really interested in. One is China. I mean, China is our biggest market. It's going to be the biggest market no matter what. Right. That's where the that's where the, the big big demand's going on. What has the what what has the trade war? What is the trade war doing to the project's relationship with China? I I suspect the answer is going to be it's sort of put it into hold. Uh, not formally in hold. Nobody, the administration certainly won't admit it's in hold. But, but parsing the words, I suspect what we're going to hear is, uh, China's still reviewing. China's, you know, review, needs to do more due diligence. We're negotiating agreements. Uh, there's complex issues, uh, involved. Things that, that I would do or others would do if they were in contract negotiations and our boss had told us to put things in a hold state until we figure out the bigger picture and whether it fits in the bigger picture anymore. Uh, but, but that's one critical area. What's going on with China? Second issue is the FID decision, final investment, uh, decision, uh, and, and, and whether, uh, where, where the project sits with respect to FID. FID is critically important. FID is the go, no go point. Uh, FID, when you make an FID decision, uh, you're saying we're going forward with this project. You start incurring a huge amount of money, uh, and and you start uh, you've locked in the construction contracts, and you're really just executing uh, on the plan you've developed up to FID. We're we're hopefully not anywhere near FID with this project uh, right now because we haven't negotiated underlying agreements, we haven't arranged financing, uh, we haven't sort of put together the game plan for how this all fits together. But but it's always it, it, it's always useful to ask where you are, uh, where you visualize FID and, and what you visualize as the steps to get to FID, because it really tells you where a project is and how thoroughly they're thinking through it. One of the critical pieces of this project is, is how are you going to contract with the contractors that are actually going to build the project? Those contracts and that process 
determines the extent to which you've, ex you've exposed yourself to cost overruns. That's the process, frankly, that the majors excel at, getting, getting that process between the ditches, narrowing it down, uh, uh, ex uh, running out the possibility or, or e eliminating the possibility of significant cost overruns, ex significant changes. That's, that's a critical component of putting together a successful project. Um, and, and FID tells you, what, what, do you what, what do you visualize as your FID date, where are you in that process, sort of tells you whether they're, how they're doing in the management of getting those, uh, those contracts together. Um, and and I, I really don't recall uh, uh, the project talking about a hard FID date uh, and where they are in that process. So that's a that's a the second question. Third question is cost. What's your cost projection? As you get closer to FID, as you work through the process, your cost range should be narrowing. You should be getting more more confident about your cost range. Um, and 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 I think it's useful. It's timely to ask the project where they are on costs. And then the final question is, what's your plan for management um, of the FID process, getting to FID, uh, and then beyond? Because again, that drives the potential for cost overruns, uh, and that's where the majors excel. The project has been under AGDC management, state management. It's not had the involvement of the majors. Um, there's a concern on my part and others that we've sort of sent in the rookie team, not talking about anybody individually, but as a team, sort of the rookie team to manage this process. We would greatly benefit by having the expertise that the majors have developed, Exxon's developed, BP and others have developed in, uh, in, in how you get to FID and then going beyond FID. Um, and, and I think the question of how are you managing the FID process uh, is a critical, uh, critical one to surface um, at this opportunity as well. So that leads me to, I guess, two questions. Um, first, I'll ask this question. Harold in the chat room says, Qatar is ramping up as we speak. Um, so are many other global LNG projects with producer support. Alaska LNG is only viable if China takes advantage of moving into Alaska with this low-wage scales and Chinese companies. This would be a non-starter for Alaska and the USA companies. What do you say? Well, I don't, I don't know if any of that's true. I mean, yes, Qatar is ramping up, but I don't know what the terms of the Alaska-China uh, 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 arrangement will be. I don't think even Alaska knows what the terms of the Alaska-China uh, arrangement will be. Uh, the producers have indicated that they're that 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 they are uh, involved in this process through you know selling their uh, uh, gas to the project. BP, I don't think, would be making a commitment of its production if it didn't believe this project had the prospect of being uh, successful, they would be, be looking at other ways to monetize the resource. So I, we don't know enough. That, that's frankly one of the benefits of these quarterly assessments. We don't know enough to know uh, whether the assumptions about the, un, uh, about the economic nature of the Alaska project is true or not. That's what, uh, that's what this process is for. That's why we need to ask questions. I don't I think it's premature to go in and, assume, and and say we need to terminate this project or we need to abandon this project because there's no way it can ever work. There are ways this project can work. Uh, this is an opportunity to check on whether we are, we are pursuing those ways or whether we're getting we're, we're going off the road. Uh, you said that most of your questions seem to be fairly commonsensical, which I again find ironic. Um, but you know, and you, do you think that those questions will be asked? And if not, you know, which one probably wouldn't? And is there another question that should be asked? you think that this legislature would just either not think to ask or would be too uncomfortable asking when it's all said and done? Well, I, I, think, I think these are fairly obvious questions. I think the legislature will ask these questions. Uh, staff uh, on this project, uh, staff at the legislature fairly have kept themselves fairly knowledgeable. Uh, here's, here's what what I think the concern is that the legislature won't press for answers uh, in the public forum uh, when they ask these questions. They'll ask about China. They'll get a they'll get an answer that says, "Yeah, we're still talking." In fact, we had these meetings in in Washington, and we talked about accelerating the pros the project, and we have we're scheduling these meetings between the negotiators. That to me is a non-answer. I mean, I the the question is, where really are you? 
the trade the trade dispute is massive. Right. China doesn't know what the U.S. is is doing. They're putting on hold all sorts of things with respect to the U.S. Is this one of them? Answer that question. I I, I think. The concern about the legislature is in a public forum they won't press for definitive answers, and so what we'll get is sort of the sort of mush answers, and won't really maximize the opportunity uh, of having of having the project surface in this in this in this fashion for the uh, for the legislative session. Brad Keithley's our guest, Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. Brad, let's wrap things up. Those are a big top three. I think we've got a lot of. Uh, interesting things uh let's summate and and tell the listeners and folks out there what can we do to help address your big three issues today i mean we've got again we've got this narrative from the news media from the administration and kind of this lack of diligence in getting the whole truth or both sides of the truth we've got the analysis on the budget and the budgetary process and now we've got the state lng meeting what 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 can we do to try and make these things better Michael, we, the legislators are, are are at the most vulnerable part of their process right now relative to their constituents. They're asking for votes. Uh, they're engaged in a lot of town halls. They're doing door to doors. Uh, they're they're open to. I mean, they're engaging on social media. Uh, they're open to ask uh, to answering questions. They're being interviewed by the news media. What I think the best thing to do is to be asking these questions of legislative candidates. Uh, asking them, where do you stand? Uh, do you believe that the budget's almost balanced? Do you believe the APRN story? Do you believe, uh, uh, and if not, what, 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 what do you believe about that? Uh, do you believe that we need to make changes to the budgeting process? What are those changes you think we need to believe, uh, need to make? Where do you think we are on the, on the AKLNG process? Uh, are, are we getting good answers, uh, to the questions that need to be asked? That's, you've got legislators and, and governor candidates who are, who are, who are open, um, have opened themselves up. This process opens them up to, to dealing with those questions. So this is the time, uh, if there's ever going to be a time to engage with your legislator, your wannabe legislators, the candidates, and to ask them these questions. Get them on the record. Uh, 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 get them down to specifics uh, about these issues. Find out what they're saying. Now, you know, as, as happened with Walker four years ago, they may tell you one thing and do another when they, <laughs> when they get elected, but at least you, at least you have some baseline uh, on which to judge whether they're thinking about the issues correctly uh, and, and the approaches that they have in mind are going to get you to a successful, successful conclusion. So from, from the standpoint of listeners, take this opportunity to engage with your candidates. It's never going to get better than this. You're never going to have a better opportunity than this. Well, I think that that's good advice. I hope we do it. Uh, Karen just said something. She said, ha ha, ask George Rauscher, watch his eyes glaze over. I don't know. You, you became famous. I don't know if you saw the video of uh, the question that was played from a video clip of this show. Uh, to George Rauscher on the 331 vote. There's some interesting stuff that's happening. I think, Brad, with your help, we're making a difference out there and getting people's attention. And I think that, you know, if we could keep the pressure on, we may be able to make some some big changes here. Yeah, I agree, Michael. And 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 hopefully you'll be able to get the candidates uh, as we as we zero in on election hour, you'll be able to get the candidates on the show and ask them the hard questions. And then we'll have you know, we'll have the tape of, of what they what they say on them. So it's a, it's a role that everybody has to play. Has to play. You have to play. I, I have a role in, in the sense of raising the questions and talking to the candidates that I deal with. Uh, people door to door have a role of asking candidates uh, in their districts the, the the hard questions. George Rauscher is a good example of that. Uh, and you have a role to play in terms of getting candidates on the show and asking them the questions. This is the time to be asking those questions. To be to be getting. Uh, inside their brains and figuring out what they're thinking. Well, we're working on it, and uh, we'll be back uh, at it full steam ahead uh, next week as well. We're going to try and get some more candidates on this week, but uh, we'll be back at it uh, full steam ahead uh, on Monday, and we'll, uh, you know, we've got a pretty short window here, so we've already asked most of the uh, administrative candidates, governor and lieutenant governor, and now we're going to work our way down some of these uh uh, some of these uh, House and Senate uh, seats and see if we can get those info, that info in there. I really appreciate you, Brad, helping us here um, and, uh, and, and keeping us on track with this. 
Michael, thanks for the opportunity. I enjoy it as always. As always, it's good to speak with you. Ladies and gentlemen, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget, coming in every week to help us uh, right here on the Michael Duke Show, your home for Common Sense Radio. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.